and we rejoice in his provision for us. I thank you folks for being here today and for your faithfulness. And we are going to continue our study. We've made it all the way to Genesis chapter 27. And I'm Pastor Dave Couyers of Country Bible Church. And, uh, and I post it on YouTube. Uh, I've been sharing my slide share a little bit with several folks. If, if you have a Bible book study and you want to get the list of specific books of the Bible, I can do that or one book. And my apologies to our YouTube audience that Genesis 26 had microphone disconnected, and so it went out and got published with no audio. So sorry about that. Then I wanted to show you this. I came across this. There is no racism allowed. Okay? There's only one race. If you are a human, you are in the human race. That's the only race that we can uh, procreate through. And we can procreate through people of every country around the world. Uh, if you're a human, you are of the same family. Uh, all of these baby girls or babies are twins, non-identical twins. I love these two holding their little siblings with mixed colors. Skin co we all have the same skin color. The same melanoma in your skin is the same color in everybody. Some have more, some have less. The Lord put us in the right region of the world to have either absorb more sunlight or absorb less sunlight. So if you are in Africa, you get a lot of pigment in your skin to protect your skin from the ultraviolet rays. If you're Norwegian like me, then you are going to be a lot fairer skin. And in order to get your daily vitamin D, you need to not reject so much of the sunlight. So we're all the same one way or the other. All of these are twins, non-identical twins. Amazing. And I bring this up because we are all descended from Noah through Shem is the bloodline that we're following. Remember there was Shem, uh, there was three, um, three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Well, we're only focusing because Christ is in the Shem line. Uh, we are in the Shem line. And we've been studying Father Abram, and we got down to Isaac, and we're now down to Jacob. And that's going to descend down to the 12 tribes, and they become called Jews. So we are all one family. You're my Hermona, Hermana, Hermo, you know what I mean, brother and sister. So you remember our Genesis outline? Four events in the first 11 chapters, creation, fall, flood, and the scattering of the nations. And then we have made it down in the second half of the book of Genesis with where we're studying four men. Father Abraham just died. Isaac's just about to die. And we're down to, um, we'll eventually get down to Jacob and Joseph. And so we are at the Isaiah one. And, and the first 11 chapters cover about 2,000 years or about one third of human history. So we get down to Jacob gets his Isaac's blessing through subterfuge. That's what we're going to look at. Last time, and this, again, I apologize that I published it all over the world without realizing the audio wasn't there. It's still good, valuable, buddy, and you can open your Bible and go slide by slide. But um, Genesis 26, we found out the, about God's law and commandments before Mount Sinai. Uh, and we've looked at the first use of the word commandment and the word statute and the word law. And then we looked at poverty, vows, and wealth. And then we studied the uh, name Judith, my wife's name. So Jewish perspectives had this. And I, I want you to think about what they're saying here uh, because they've got a little bias since they're Jews. Quote, Esau is born first. He is the hairy and red-headed. Then follows Jacob, who is holding Esau's heel as he is born. Esau and Jacob are quite different. Esau is sly and loves to hunt, while Jacob is peaceful and spends most of his time studying Torah. <coughs> <coughs> Torah. I remember the Torah didn't exist then. On the day that Abraham is buried, Esau goes hunting, while Jacob stays home and cooks a pot of lentils for his father to eat. 
A person who is mourning a loved one eats round foods when he or she comes back from the funeral. So can you see a bias in this account if you've read what the Bible says about it? <laughs> you know, Esau is sly and loves to hunt. Well, sly, Jacob is named the deceiver and the heel catcher. <laughs> Esau seems to be pretty forthright to me. He's, he's not interested in spiritual things. So he's out there doing hunting stuff. But Jacob is peaceful and spends most of his time studying Torah. <laughs> so anyway, I thought it was interesting how our bias can creep in, even when we're really knowledgeable. And then we study the word Judith. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Biri, the Hittite, and also Basemath, daughter of Elon, the Hittite. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. And I said, and you thought I'd skip this verse? You're crazy. This is the only reference to Judith in the Bible. And Judith means Jewess or praised, uh, the daughter of Biri, the Hittite, and wife of Esau. And remember, it comes off of Judah, the male name. This is the feminine side of it. And they both mean praised. And then I wanted you to remember that we are, uh, after Esau sells his birthright, but before his blessing is stolen. We're going to see his, the stealing of his blessing today. So we're going to need to change that slide. Focusing on Isaac's life about 20, around 2000 BC. So we are here. We're looking at focusing now on Isaac. And uh, Ishmael has kind of dropped off the scene. He's still alive. But you're not going to see anything more about Ishmael. Uh, Jacob is already born and going along on his merry way, but he's still with his father and, and mother. Uh, same thing with Esau. And we're up here. Around, around 2,000 years after creation and around 2,000 years before the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. And Father Abraham's dead and gone. Um, so verse 23, he went up. From there to Beersheba, we learned last time. And that's where he's at now. That's where all of his life takes place, basically, or focuses on. Um, hola, good you're here. Um, Good morning. So this was um, Isaac's journeys, and he spent a lot of time down here in Beersheba, which is in Negev. And Negev is, uh, simply means... Uh, the south or El, El Sur Hebrew word for the south country in Genesis twenty four sixty two. so we're down here our whole time will be down here south of Jerusalem and Hebron and everything uh, west of the Dead Sea on the southern end over here would be Jordan Petra and Jordan where, we'll, uh, where the Jews will run to when when the Antichrist chases them. And so we are there. So if you will, please open your Bibles to chapter 27 of Genesis. And if you're able and you got your Bible open, stand and we will read it and I will read it to you from the NAU translation. But we'll put up also the, uh, the Spanish translation. <coughs> and I'm using the SRV for the Spanish. Genesis 27, verse 1. Now it came about when Isaac was old and his eyes were too dim to see that he called his older son Esau and said to him, My son. And he said to him, Here I am. Isaac said, Behold, now I am old and do not know the day of my death. Now then, please take your gear, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. And prepare a savory dish for me, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat so that my soul may bless you before I die. Rebekah was listening while Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game to bring home, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, Behold, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, saying, Bring me some game and prepare a savory dish for me, that I may eat and bless you in the presence of Jehovah, Yahweh, before my death. Now therefore, my son, listen to me as I command you. Go, go now to the flock and bring me two choice young goats from there, that I may prepare them as a savory dish uh, for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall bring to your father that he may eat, 
so that he may bless you before his death. Verse 11, Jacob answered his mother, Rebekah, Behold, Esau, my brother, is hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and then I will be a deceiver in his sight, and I will bring upon myself a curse and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, Your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. So I went and got, So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory food such as his father loved. Verse 15, Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her elder son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins on the young goats on his hands and the smooth part of his neck. She also gave the savory food and the bread which she had made to her son Jacob. Then he came to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Get up, please, sit and eat my game, that you may bless me. Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have had it so quickly, my son? He said, Because the Lord our God caused it to happen to me. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come close that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob came close to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother's Esau. So he blessed him and said, Are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. So that he said, Bring it to me, and I will eat of my son's game, that I may bless you. And he brought it to him, and he ate. He also brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Uh, Isaac said to him, Please come close and kiss me, my son. So he came close and kissed him, and when he smelled the smell of his garments, he blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which Lord Jehovah, Yahweh, has blessed. Now may God give you the dew of heaven and out of the fatness of the earth and an abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you and the nations bow down to you. Be master of your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you, and blessed be those who bless you. Now it came about as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had hardly gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from hunting. Then he also made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that he may bless me. Isaac, his father, said to him, Who are you? And he said, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled violently and said, Who is he then that hunted game and brought it to me, so that I ate of all of it before you, came and blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out, with an exceedingly great and bitter cry, and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Your brother came deceitfully and was taken away your blessing. Then he said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? (coughs) But Isaac replied to Esau, Behold, I have made him your master and all his relatives. I have given to him as servants, uh, and with grain and new wine I have sustained him. Now as for you then, what can I do, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. So Esau lifted his voice and wept. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, and your brother shall also serve. You and your brother you shall serve. But it shall come about when you become restless that you will break his yoke from your neck. So Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near, and then I will kill my brother Jacob. Verse 42. 
And now the words of her elder son Esau were reported to Rebekah. She sent and called her younger son Jacob and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau is consoling himself concerning you by planning to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice and arise. Flee to Haran to my brother Laban. Stay with him a few days until your brother's fury subsides, until your brother's anger against you subsides, and he forgets what you did to him. Then I will send and get you from there. Why should I be bereaved of you both in one day? Rebekah said to Isaac, I am tired of living because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth, like these from the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? Thank you, folks. The Lord bless the reading of his uh, word. So I know that's a big chapter. Uh, Last time we did this, I did at least two or three chapters, but uh, it must be my old age. I'm slowing down. We're only doing one chapter at a time, so... Um, but what a strange, the son and wife conspire to deceive the old blind father. What a, what a horrid chapter. You know, this is one of the ugliest. To me, it almost compares with these, uh, Genesis 38. And we'll get there before you know it. It's kind of sorted also. But I put this, I know I showed you this last time. We're looking at it again. Isaac and Rebecca, would you steal a birthright from your blind husband? You know, what a... <laughs> What a mischievous wife, at least. And talk about a dysfunctional family. Uh, And I say, I've seen quite a few messed up families before, but none quite as bad as this one. I've seen some treacherous spouses and husbands and children, uh, but... Why couldn't you have a blessing for both sons? We're going to get into that. Uh, And I think we finally solved it this time. So thank you for requiring me to dig in and dig a little deeper on this. (laughs) Because I learned something again. This every time I open God's Word, I swear I find something new that I hadn't really seen before. So, thanks for having me do the study for you. So Isaac about to die? Question mark. Isaac was about 137 years old. Of course, he's blind, so he's thinking he's he's near the end of his life. But he lives on another 43 years after this. So you know that's a long time. He's got another, what, another fourth of his year almost, or another uh, sixth of his year or something, to life to go. Sadly, one through four, Isaac shows his favoritism. It comes to full fruition. It's been going on for the whole 37 years of these two kids. It started out almost in the womb or as soon as they were born. And this favoritism has been getting worse and worse. And I believe that at this point he's disobeying God uh, probably knowingly or not knowingly, I'm not sure, but his favoritism is finally taking a hold of him. And that's a sin. It's bad news when we show favoritism. Uh, so I showed you this artwork before with Rebecca lurking in the background. That's too close to him. He would have smelled her too. <laughs> Blindness enheightens your smell factory. And uh, so that's why they had to put you know, Esau's clothes on him causes me to wonder what Esau must have smelled like. I've had some friends like that. I know some, some uh, hippies now that uh, the, one, the one time we went elk hunting with a guide, uh, you'll have to ask me about that on our free time sometime. But <laughs> Isaac shows his favoritism. God had told Rebekah way back in chapter 25, verse 23, the older will serve the younger. Is that pretty clear? The pecking order of these two children, the younger, the older will serve the younger. Esau forsook his birthright. He married pagan wives just to make his parents angry. And yet Isaac still wants to give him the blessing. And, you know, talk about favoritism, you know. The, the minute that he gave up his birthright for a bowl of soup, I would have said, oh, okay, you obviously don't want the birthright. You won't get the blessing either. Because they usually go hand in hand. So we tend to spoil either the first or the last born, the worst of all the children. That's been my experience. And, and I say we must not, and that's because I'm a number two son. <laughs> okay? But we, if you watch humans, you'll find out that usually it's the first born or the last born that get the most favoritism from the parents. Verse 13. So who's responsible for this mess that we're in? We kind of blame Jacob for it, but... <coughs> 
Genesis 27, 13. But his mother said to him, your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them. Go get them for me. And I wonder if he wasn't mostly greed that moved him to obey his mother and dishonor his father. Because that's what he's doing here. He knew he had to dishonor his father, you know, breaking the, the, uh, fifth, the fifth commandment. And, and she says, the curse be on me. The Jews kind of did that at the trials of Jesus too. And they said, the curse be on us and our children. And a lot of people use that with wrong uh, anti-Semitism. But anyway. So 19 and 20. I say the lying gets even worse. It's like they crank up lying on steroids at this point. So all of a sudden now he's flat out lying. Verse 19. Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Get up, please sit and eat of my game that you may be blessed. His grandfather told half his lies. His dad told whole lies. And now his grandson is lying big time. It's like, Sin does that. Sin escalates. It goes out exponentially, generally. You can't, it's very hard to sin by yourself unless it's just in your mind. But when we practice sin, when we do sin, it's almost universally with somebody else or you're doing something to somebody else. So, and and it grows as it goes out. And that's what we see here. You know, Father Abraham, it was his half half sister, half, half wife. You know, it was a half-truth, I should say. But his dad flat-out lied about, she is my sister, and she wasn't a half-sister. Uh, and now this grandson is in this huge deception, takes up a whole chapter on the one, one big deception they do. I found this. On a beautiful fall day, four of our, my granddaughter's friends decided to go for a drive instead of showing up to class on time. When they did arrive, the girls explained to the teacher that they had had a flat tire. The teacher accepted their excuse, much to the girls' relief. Since you missed this morning's quiz, you must take it now, she said. Please sit in the four corner seats in this room without talking. When they were seated, the teacher said, on your paper, write down the answer to one question. Which tire was flat? I like that. So lying is never good. But this one, verse 20, lying in the name of Jehovah Yahweh Hashem. You know, if you have to include the name of the Lord in your lies, you probably shouldn't be lying. That's like, talk about cranking it up on steroids. Uh, Verse 20, Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have... So quickly, you have have it so quickly, my son. And he said, because the Lord Jehovah, your God, caused it to happen to me. (coughs) And I see this as breaking uh, the third commandment. Do not take the name of the Lord God in vain. This in vain means vainly, means without reason or substance. It means just empty or shallow. Uh, it drives me crazy everywhere in our culture. They go, um, uh, what's that saying they do? Uh, G-O, not G-O-D. It's three letters. That means, uh, you, you'll know, of, you can't think of it either. Um, O-M-G. Huh? O-M-G. Oh my God, they say, yeah. And it's everywhere. And I see it as a violation of it. It's taken God's name in a, in a frivolous way or a, or a non-respectful way. The Jews would never do this. The Jews won't even print this word out, God, G-O-D. Devout Jews, they will put a capital G, a dash, and a lowercase d whenever they want to write God. They won't pronounce this Lord as we do. We have a personal relationship with him. I'm a co-heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my brother, as well as my Lord and Savior and God infinite. So I, as a co-heir of Jesus Christ, I attempt to pronounce this word. Nobody really exactly knows the pronunciation of it. 
but God gave it to us over and over in Scripture, and he didn't mean that we should skip over that word or substitute another word there. That is his personal name for, for, the, for the Trinity. Um, so anyway, yeah, OMG is, uh, we'll see, uh, see oh if that gosh. brings judgment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, of course, the ultimate blasphemy of God's name is to use it as a cuss word. And that's become so commonplace in our culture, it shakes my core also. Makes me. So lying in the name of Jehovah, God caused it to happen, he says you know, about this deceit. Um, Matthew 26, 30, 73, a little water, the bystanders, a little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, surely you were one of them, for even the way you talk gives you away. Verse 74, then he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man, and immediately a rooster crowed. So here you have Peter also, you know, Cursing like this. And by that they meant taking an oath, probably in the name of the Lord. They would swear by the altar or swore by the gold or swore by the temple or these things. And it was an oath kind of a deal. This deception, I didn't get to talk about it, but uh, was J. Vernon McGee or David Hawkins or one of them talked about a, a benefit dinner that one of their churches threw uh, with some venison that somebody had provided venison to them. And so they had a big banquet and they had a lot of people. And more people showed up than expected. And so all of a sudden they realized they weren't going to have enough venison. So somebody ran out and butchered a goat or two and brought them in. The texture and the flavor and everything is very, very similar. It's hard to discern between the two. Um, and so that's why he got away with it. Plus it's savory. That means it's spicy or or salty, or peppery, or whatever, savory, tangy. Verse 27, I was intrigued by this idea of being betrayed with a kiss. Does that sound familiar to you? Verse 27, so he came close and kissed him. And when he smelled the smell of his garments, he blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field with which the Lord Jehovah has blessed. Uh, and Luke twenty-two forty-eight, 48, but Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? I don't think that's a coincidence. It could very well be that the Lord was thinking about Genesis 27 when this came up. And this deception here to deceive your poor old dying blind father and deceive him with a kiss and, and, and to have added they had to get him to wear his clothes so he smelled like his brother. And that's serious lying. That's serious deception. So I want you to flash back a minute on that other slide I showed you about the Jewish perspective on this chapter, <laughs> about how wonderful Jacob was through this whole story. <laughs> so it's, it's either or. So you, it should be coming up in your mind. How can a Lord use a sinner like Jacob to create all 12 tribes with all the blessings and promises they get. If you're wondering about that, I want you to also think about how can God use a sinner like you or me? Only by his grace, right? And if he couldn't choose a sinner, who would he choose? Right. To be his prophets and, and servants. You know, if you try to limit yourself to not using sinners, you just removed the entire human race, every descendant of Adam and Eve. So he has to choose from sinners. And he uses them well and uses them as good and bad examples. And I believe we're getting a lot of bad examples here in Genesis 27. So coincidence, question mark, do you think this is just a coincidence or is it more likely God's supernatural natural providence and arrangement of the very details of recorded history and of the Bible. And I say, uh, Chuck Missler used to always say, the rabbis have a saying, coincidence is not a kosher word. Here the universal expression of love and affection is used in another deception. There's another one in 2 Sam 20 verse 9, and we just looked at Judas also. So, Sadly, the deception works. You know, Jacob gets blessed. 
Um, so God takes his tapestry, if you would, and weaves these corrupted threads into it, but it still is accomplishing his purpose. He said two chapters ago, the, younger will, the older will serve the younger. And now we're seeing that come about in spite of all this human sin. The blessing, verse 29. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master of your brothers and may your bro- mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you and blessed be those who bless you. Dr. Ryrie says the blessing included both benediction and prediction, verse 29. Being master of your brothers, verse 29, meant that Jacob would be head of the household. He would be the high priest of their family. He would be the highest deal of it. I didn't do a slide. I didn't catch it till just now, but peoples will serve you. That should immediately make you think of Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, where the son of man, the ultimate descendant of Jacob, comes before the Ancient of Days, the Father, I believe, and it says that all nations will bow down to him or serve him, exactly as this is predicted of it. This is a prophecy of the ultimate son of Jacob, who is Messiah, the ultimate son of Isaiah, uh, the ultimate, excuse me, of Isaac, the ultimate son of Father Abraham, is Jesus Christ. And peoples, all nations will serve him and bow down before Jesus. Blessed be those who bless you. The curse be on those who curse you and blessed be those who bless you. That should sound very familiar to you. Anybody know the reference to it that we're looking for that I'll flip up next? You need to memorize this reference. Genesis chapter 12, the first three verses is crucial All your Bible reading and study needs to be, in life, needs to be considering Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. I will make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curses thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. On this authority, there can be no doubt that one of the chief reasons for God's blessing on America has been her blessing of Israel. And history has proven this to be a concrete fact. This is written in stone. I've gone through the list of nations before. Spain was, there was no navy on earth like the Spanish Armada. They conquered the new world. They were the most powerful military on the planet until they evicted the Jews from Spain, uh, 1492. They cast them out. And from there, there was a downhill, like flushing a toilet bowl spiral. And now, now they're practically a third world country. England, the sun never set on the British Empire. The whole world was their terrain. There was no military on the planet like England's. They were rulers of the world. The British sterling silver pound was the coin realm like the American dollar is for just a little while longer. That was what the sterling was. No place was like it until they turned their back on the Jews. First and Second World War. And now they become practically, you know, they're, I hate to put them in the category of a third world country, but they're no longer dominant. What happened to Germany? Total devastation. And on and on and on. There's a long list of nations that have turned against Israel. Sadly, my country is in the process of turning her back on Israel. Not a good idea. It's not a good idea. And there are consequences to our actions. Verse 30 to 35, I say the deception is exposed. Verse 33, then Isaac trembled violently and said, who was that? Who was he that hunted game and brought it to me so that I ate all of it before you came and blessed him? Yes, and he shall be blessed. I say he's not angry. So why is he trembling violently? 
Why not rescind the stolen blessing or, or give another example as you ask? Why not just bless the second son also? Bless him even better than the first blessing. I think it's tied closely and it wasn't until this time studying through that I think I picked up on this last time 20 years ago. But uh, Isaac trembled violently. I believe, let me see what I've got here. Uh, based on Hebrews 11, 20, I think the trouble violently might be secret here. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. So this is a prophecy that he's, that he's revealed. Uh, verse 25, 23, the Lord Jehovah said to her, two nations are in your womb, two nations will be separated from your body, one people should be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. I say, could it be that Isaac realized that he'd been working against God when he trembled violently? Then by faith, Hebrews eleven twenty, he refused Esau's request, left Isaac's blessing, and prophesied as God wanted. I think this is why he didn't issue another blessing or rescind the previous. He's the top judge in the land. He is the head of their family. He can pretty much do what he wants. I believe I'm going to show you why. It's like a will and testament. It's not a simple thing to rescind. But the one who makes a will and testament can write a new one in their law, in the uh, Code of Hammurabi and others. Also, at that time, you could write a will. I think in the pit of his gut, the Lord revealed to him how far he was astray on insisting on bla putting the blessing on Esau, in spite of the fact that he'd sold his birthright, he had no interest in spiritual things, he had no desire to become the high priest of his family, and he had no desire to be in that bloodline to the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew the prophecies, and yet he rejected it, and God rejected him. If you flipped over to Romans chapter 9, you'd see that God loved Jacob and hated Esau. That's a strange passage until you read it in light of this and you consider what the position was of him. Even in the womb. Yeah, even in the womb. Yeah, before he was born, it says. So Isaac thinks he's about to die, Genesis uh, 27, 35. And he said, your brother came deceitfully. This is part of his name almost. And has taken away your blessing. I say deathbed testimonies like a will, uh, last will and testament, are, were not reversible. Um, I think he probably could have, but customarily they were not reversible. Just like our will and testament now is. Only the testator can, can change the will or revise the will in our, in our culture. Verse 32, Esau said, Behold, I'm about to die. So of what that use then is the birthright to me, back in chapter 25. <coughs> so it was this, you know, you can consider this to be Esau's supposed deathbed statement when he sold his birthright. He needed the soup more than he needed a birthright. And so even though he thought he was going to die, he sold his birthright for a pot of porridge. Uh, Dr. Ryrie, talking about irreversible, says, Genesis 27, 33. He shall be blessed. Isaac realized that his blessing had been given in irreversible legal form. And I think, I you hate to override Dr. Ryrie, but I think far more important than the fact that this is an irreversible legal form is the fact that it's in direct opposition to what God had proclaimed. Direct opposition. Exactly the opposite of what God had said would be is what Esau is trying to do here. And I think the Lord confronted him about it and he was shaking violently about it because of it. I've been there a couple of times. When the Lord convicts you of sin, it cuts to the core of your being. I mean, I can remember being in Monterey in a hotel with my wife down there. Uh, we just made, I'd made a bad business deal and and the Lord convicted me that I hadn't even prayed about it. And it just broke me down into sobbing tears. It's like, I don't want to disappoint my Lord like that. But, and I think that's what, that's what happened to Isaac. So the deceiver has been deceived in verse 36. 
Then he said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Okay, show of hands. How many of you think you can identify what supplanted means? Anybody? Feel comfortable giving a definition? I, I thought our teacher would, yeah. <laughs> like transplanting the plant? Supplanted. I'm going to show you in just a minute. Um, because I, I questioned it when we got to this point, too. It's translated supplanted in all of those modern translations, plus the KVUV and the New King James Version uh, and all the others. The SRV, the Spanish one, has Zangando su veces. My brother tells me to try not to read Spanish. So. Because I blow the pronunciations up. <laughs> Lo siento. <laughs> uh, ESV has cheated me rather than supplanted. NIV has taken advantage of me. NIV old has deceived me. Net Bible has tripped me up. They're going on the, on the idea of a heel catcher. Young's literal says, Take me by the heel, a direct translation of the being a heel catcher. And that's part of the definition of the word uh, Jacob. So that's kind of why I want to look at this. When you see this kind of variation, I mean, what we would say is deceived is not in there. All of those words are English words that they're trying to change to, to, to define this Hebrew word. It's usually translated supplanted. My Mac Dictionary defines supplanted as a verb with an object. Uh, supersede or replace is the big deal. Take the position of. Another discovery could supplant the original filing or take its place or come on top of it. Uh, it comes from the Middle English, Old French supplanter or Latin supplantare, trip up from, uh, from below. So you can see it's closely tied to this idea of a heel catcher. Somebody that's hiding in the bushes and they grab your heel when you go by and down you go. You trip them up. Trick them. A deceiver. A, a trickster. Then there's this word play, I believe, in the Hebrew. Ya'abab and Akabed. There's a word play going on here with his name uh, Jacob. And the Hebrew word translated into English as supplant, akeb, okay? And I apologize. I know my pronunciation of Spanish is no, no es bueno, <laughs> es malo. Uh, and I know my Hebrew and also my Greek pronunciation. So don't get your pronunciations of these three languages from me. I can barely handle English. Uh, but my computer's really smart and that's what I use, so... So, Strong's data for the name Jacob is number 3290. Ya'akab is how, kind of how you would pronounce it in Hebrew. This is my grandfather's name, so I've looked at it before. He's the son of Isaac, also his descendants. Uh, and it, it's coming from this root here, 6119. Uh, Jacob comes up 331 times, and the plural another 18 times. So you're over 350 times here that this word is used. Uh, was he then named Jacob or Ya'akab? Uh, and then this is the root that it comes from, 6119, for the root of it, or parallel, close to it. Akab. And that one means heel, footprint, hind part. Footprints, footsteps, heel, heel, heels, hooves, rear guard steps, and all those kinds of things. So they're closely associated with his name. There's a, a big word play going on in the Hebrew with this. So Jacob, Ya'akab, is his name, and he's also known to be a Akabab, or Akab, a heel catcher, tripper upper, a trickster, a deceiver, a supplanter, etc. So there, the Old Testament is just full of these Hebrew word plays. I mean, it's like on every page. I, I swear it's almost every page. And I don't take time to try to show them all to you. But some of them like this, you need to get, see this relationship to the name Jacob and this practice of being a heel catcher, a supplanter, a tripper. But he got the blessing. 
This lying, thieving, conniving deceiver got the blessing by hiding behind the firstborn beloved son's name and wearing his clothes. I say, what a rat. Bad news is, so have we, haven't you? We were lying, thieving, conniving deceivers who got our blessing by hiding behind the firstborn beloved son's name, Jesus, and by wearing his clothes, his perfect sinless righteousness. What rats we were, and yet now we are perfect in Christ. When God looks down from heaven to you, he doesn't see sinful Sil or Karen or Ellen or anybody. He sees a perfect circle of white Jesus, sinless perfection. And that's, we've clothed ourselves with his righteousness. And you can feel free to say, Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So if God in his grace can justify Jacob, he can even justify you and me. Amen? All sinners. He can only choose from sinners. So Then I wanted to spend a little time on verse 36 with this idea of the birthright and the blessing. I want you to get the idea that there's two separate things here. They're so closely commingled, they usually come up as one. But you need to understand that there's two aspects of this. One is the birthright, one is the blessing. Verse 36, Esau said, Isn't he rightly named Yaakob or Jacob? He has deceived me these two times. He took my birthright, past tense, and now he's taken my blessing. Okay? Hebrews 12, 16. Now there was no immoral or godless person, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright, for a single meal, verse 17. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. So he's wailing on his father's deathbed there to try and get a blessing also, which would be contradictory to God's prophecy and, and what God said would happen and wants to happen. <coughs> but can you see that there's two times he's done this? There's two aspects of blessing and birthright. And there seems to be a pun with the word blessing in Hebrew, uh, barakah, and the word birthright, bekorah. You can kind of hear, even with my bad pronunciation of them, they're, they're closely associated. Uh, Easton Bible Dictionary says this word denotes the special privileges and advantage belonging, and we're talking about birthright, belonging to the firstborn son among the Jews. He became the priest of his family, thus Reuben was the firstborn of the patriarchs, and so the priesthood of the tribes belonged to him. That honor was, however, transferred to God from Reuben to Levi, in Numbers 3.13 and so on. Uh, the firstborn son had allotted to him also a double portion of the paternal inheritance. Esau's transfer, his birthright to Jacob in 2533. They go on. Number two, number three, the firstborn inherited the judicial authority of his father, whatever it might have been, might be. David excluded Adonijah in favor of Solomon. This is a common thread all through scripture that the younger ends up be taking the firstborn. And I'm going to show you why that's important. But I want you to remember Adonijah was the oldest and yet Solomon became king. The, number four, the Jews attached a sacred importance to the rank of firstborn. Crucial word here, rank of firstborn. I want you to think about that. It's a position or an office I'm going to show you. And first begotten is applied to the Messiah in Romans 8.29, Colossians 1.18, Hebrews 1, 4 through 6. As firstborn, he has an inheritance superior to his brethren and is the alone true peace. So he has judicial authority. He is the, the Supreme Court judge of the family. And he's also the true high priest of the family. Two important factors. And he's also the money manager. The, he's the treasurer. He's the CEO. He's the vice president. He's the treasurer. He's the whole ball of wax. He is king of his family, if you would. And it's a kingship office that this firstborn birthright is talking about. 
I say birthright equals office. Might help you to think of the firstborn birthright as an office like CEO. Very many of the firstborn children in the Bible lost their firstborn rights, consequently did not achieve the family leader position like Ishmael, Esau, Aaron, Reuben, etc. And many non-firstborn were raised up to the CEO king position like Moses, David, Solomon, etc. Remember, David was the eighth born of his family. Uh, Moses had Aaron and uh, his older brother's sister also over him. Solomon had Adonijah, we just looked at, and many, many, many others. Why am I taking time to pound on the pulpit about this? I'm going to show you in the next slide. It's important that you understand that birthright doesn't mean the first one to come out of the womb. It's the office of chief priest and CEO king of the family that was generally assigned to the first one that came out of the womb. But the Bible, when it's using birthright here, it's talking, or firstborn, it's talking not so much about who came out of the womb first as it is who is the ruling, reigning, high priest, and judge infinite and provider of the family, the one who took care of all the widows and orphans, the one who managed all the affairs and all the money. That's what this office is. This is a very important point when it comes up with the Jehovah Witness. They try to use Colossians 1.15, which says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, close quote. That's what Jesus is. He's the firstborn of all creation. They try to say that Jesus is just a created being, not Almighty God. Yet Colossians 1.15 is describing the absolute sovereignty that Jesus has over all creation. Not that Jesus was the first of many creations. It's talking about his position as king of the universe. King of kings and lord of lords is what Jesus Christ is. And that's what it means when it says in Colossians 1 that he is the firstborn over all creation. He's a ruling reigning office. And I sat across the table from a JW in my kitchen for hours one Wednesday afternoon presented all this to him, showed him all these Bible references of a child who was not the firstborn of their mother, who became the CEO, the king of the family. A long list of them, and we went through every Bible verse. We got all done, and he shook his head in agreement, and he goes, I see what you mean. But this is one of their main arguments, that Jesus is just a created being. Uh, patriarch equals king or family priest or judge or ruler or provider or treasurer or complete authority of the family. Some see the blessing as the swearing in ceremony or the double blessing, Genesis 48 verse 5, to care for the father's widows, etc. For further study, see the first rites of the firstborn, pages 43 in, in the Archaeological Study Bible concerning discoveries at Nuzi and Marie in Iraq. Also see Ariel's Bible commentary on Genesis, page 429. There's lots of solid evidence about this uh, birthright office. 37 to 39, we've master and servant roles established and they're fixed. Verse 37, but Isaac replied to Esau, behold, I have made him your master and all his relatives. I have given to him as servants, and with grain and new wine I have sustained him. Now as for you then, what can I do, my son? Question mark. Romans 8.31 What then shall we say to these things? If God's for us, who can be against us? Was God for or against Esau? Yes. And was he for or against Jacob? I think that Romans 8.31 is, is very providential. They're both filthy, rotten sinners. Can we agree on that? <laughs> but God chose one for his purposes to have a bloodline that goes to Messiah. And he sovereignly decreed that. The prophecy said, away from the dew, verse 39. And then Isaac said, his father answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of heaven from above. What a, I mean, that's a curse. 
<laughs> That's not a blessing that he got. But it's a prophecy, exactly what happened. This is what he inherited. And it's away from the dew. You know, compared to the lush fertile land that they were inhabiting in. This is the mountains of Seir and Edom, viewed from the king's highway. Where is that? Uh, in Israel, in the Negev, where we're, yeah, this is uh, close to Beersheba. Uh, it's the mountains of Seir and Edom, as viewed from the king's highway. The king's highway was the most important trade route. That's where everybody that went between the three continents had to travel this king's highway up through Jerusalem. The Lord strategically placed the Messiah in the Holy Land, touching almost three continents. The major people groups of the world all came and went, and he, and he did these things at the perfect time to get the word out about Messiah. Another picture of the land of Edom. Um, note the red uh, sandstone cliffs and the reddish soil. You see the red, redness of the rocks and the soil itself that ties in. This is a Bedouin camp there. When you travel around there, it's interesting to see. In ancient times, they had, this one looks like it's a woven uh, canvas and they would weave them out of goat's hair or goat skins. It's interesting because now when you drive across there and you see Bedouins in camps, and they may be out there a mile from the highway because they don't need the highway. Uh, but you can recognize the blue and green tarps out there <laughs> rather than their beautiful black hand-woven tarps. And, uh, and then I've seen pictures of them with a donkey with two five-gallon red Jeep cans on each side of the donkey stopped at the gas station getting their fuel, <laughs> carrying it back out on donkey back. So. Verse 40 and 41, Esau, the angry, unwilling servant. Esau bore a grudge. Verse 41, so Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother. This is a euphemism, the days of mourning. He's talking about when my dad dies, I'm going to kill my brother. Um, and I say verse 42 through 46. And the last one, I don't know if I did a slide for it. But Rebecca says, shall I lose both of you on one day? Well, who is she talking about when she says the both of you? Both sons or her husband and her son? Husband um, and son. Uh, well, I go back and forth. So you're both right as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and I'm not real sure. But I, I lean to think that it's on the day of the father's death. So it's probably, to me, more likely that, uh, that it was about losing uh, a father and a, a husband and a son. So we got another light out with the whole family this time. Lies just keep progressing like this. Verse 45, I'll send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? And I say, she will not live to see Jacob again. And one lie often leads to more lies. And I say, usually the lies intensify. You know, you start out with a little white lie, a little, you leave out some of the information, and then somebody challenges you on it, and you've got to then correct your tracks. I get caught on Facebook all the time. I'll, I'll post a, a picture that I think is interesting, and then one of my friends will come back and correct me on it. They go, that's not what he said. That's not Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> he wouldn't have used language like that or whatever. And I go, well, I like the saying, and I like that, but it's attributed incorrectly. And so I'll thank him for it and go take down the picture, even if I like it. But so misinformation, it goes out like that, and it gets worse. Honesty is the best policy. Clark Gotham says that coming home from work, a woman stopped at the corner deli to buy a chicken for supper. The butcher reached into a barrel, grabbed the last chicken he had, flung it up on the scales behind the counter, told the woman its weight. She thought for a moment, I really need a bit more chicken than that, she said. Do you have any larger ones? Without a word, the butcher put the chicken back into the barrel, groped around as though finding another one, pulled the same chicken out and placed it on the scales. This chicken weighs a pound more, one pound more, he announced. The woman pondered her options and then said, okay, I'll take them both. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. And I say honesty is still the best policy. It's so easy to get tripped up once you start lying, you know. Charles Swindoll said honesty has a beautiful 
a beautiful and refreshing simplicity about it. No ulterior motives, no hidden meanings, an absence of hypocrisy, duplicity, political games, and verbal superficiality. As honesty and real integrity characterize our lives, there can be no need to manipulate others. And that's a good quote. You don't see me quoting Charles Swindoll too often. There's a couple, two or three that I use, but that's a good definition of the truth. Uh, our one hymn that we sing from, from uh, Warren Hall says, truth has a name, the name Jesus. And that's, that's it. You know, what would Jesus do? Jesus would follow this outline here of how to tell the truth. No hidden agenda, no superficiality, no duplicity, no games, no verbal superficial though. You know, that's what we need to be. And as representatives, ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ, every word that comes out of our mouth should align with that list there. Uh, the mystical book of Zohar, not the Bible, says that Abraham and Jacob spent part of their lives outside of Israel, and it was only Isaac who never once the Holy Land, left the Holy Land, that was worthy of bestowing this awesome blessing. And that comes from Shabbat inspiration. I used to get a message from them every day. And of course, this is a very pro-Israeli uh, prejudice. But, and I didn't take time to, to search Isaac out more carefully, but I take him at their word that he always stayed in the land, which would be an important factor to Jews. So in closing, I used our, reused our picture that I got from uh, Shutterstock on sunrise in the Negev. So this is, we read the verse today, you're going out from the fertility of the land and you're going out where there be no dew from heaven. That's the landscape that he was embracing. Uh, and then this one, don't wait for six strong men to take you to church. Go by yourself. I'm preaching to the choir now. And this is more for our YouTube audience than it is for you sitting in the pews. Because Hebrews 9.27 says, And is as much as it appointed a man once to die, and after this comes a judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly awaiting him. Okay, I, I never realized that Hebrews 9, that's talking about the rapture. Can you see the rapture passage portion in this? When he comes at the second coming, is he going to come with reference to sin? He's going to come and judge sin. He's going to wipe out, you know, a quarter of humanity that's the remainders, huge portion of them. So when he comes and appears in the clouds for us. <coughs> then I found this on Facebook and I thought it was worthwhile. Science and the Bible. Non-believers love to attack the Bible and claim it was written by men, a bunch of goat herders, who were clueless and attack its validity on that. What they fail to realize is that God himself gave the words to these men, and because God gave them the words, what we can see is scientific knowledge written in the Bible itself that could only have come from a much more intelligent source, the Creator. And I don't know who wrote that, but I thought it was worthwhile. And this is almost, and I didn't check every line of it, it looks to me like it's copied from Ray Comfort's track that you can buy for six cents. Uh, Ray Comfort, livingwaters.org uh, or .com. And these are, and I, I couldn't get them in Espanol, so lo siente. And I may be able to buy you one in Spanish. I should look at that and see if he's, he's probably got them in Spanish. But you can look up the reference. Earth is a sphere. Round Earth, science back in the day said uh, la Biblia, la science entonces, so science then and science now. So back in the day they used to think that the Earth was a flat disk and the Bible's always said it was a sphere and the Earth we now know from satellites and everything else and math and science and evidence from 500 years ago, we proved that the Earth is a round sphere. Um, lots of these. Uh, one of them would be Job 28, 25. Air that you breathe has weight. And 
they used to say that air was weightless. And now we know that air has weight and so on. All those scientific proofs of the Bible. And uh, I usually buy the Living Waters uh, track from Ray Comfort. I love this. Just moments after Noah's an Noah abandoned the ark, they turned it into a Dollar General store. <laughs> dollar stores pop up like mushrooms. That's, and I don't know if it's going to keep going on. So this one here. You know predestination would speed up things on Judgment Day. And, and then I captioned it. The end is near? No. Nope. The end is here. Hmm. We are in the end times. So. So the end, El Finn. Thank you for your attention. The cross is the beginning, not the end. And I just threw this in on the end because uh, to rejoice in God's creation a little bit. The morning glory rainbow pool in Yellowstone National Park. Your creator painted all of these things. Unbelievable. I say, go find someone and ask them, do you believe in heaven? And then say, what do you think it will take to get to heaven? I will have to translate that into Spanish and send it to you. This is my, my line I use on the phone. Uh, do you believe in heaven is a good way to, you know, creo, uh, cielo. And I will try to get this published on YouTube, and hopefully it will have audio this time. So I say, go and find a sinner and preach the gospel to him. Thank you for your attention.